In a world where Is this thing on? Barely. This episode of the Just John podcast is brought to you by the most amazing patron on the planet and the random fact that Alaska is the only state that can be typed on one row of keys on a keyboard. What up, homies? I'm your host, John Medina, and this, my fine, fine ladies and gentlemen, is the Just John Podcast, episode 28 for the week of March 5th. Today on the show, Pokemon, the Oscars happened, McDonald's VR, and more. I have an announcement to make to y'all, to the people of America. Data caps. We all know the struggle of data caps on our mobile phones. Data caps have become an accepted part of getting internet access on your phone, and now they're slowly making their way onto the world of home internet. Comcast, AT&T, and a few other small internet providers either test data caps or already have them in active use. And this week, CenturyLink, which has like 6 million customers, said that it's looking into using the data caps as well. They said, our competition is using metered plans today, and we think it's an area we have to explore and consider. As a whole, we have not seen broadband, the big broadband internet providers using data caps in their services, but it's starting to become more prominent. Comcast has been rolling it out city by city as it looks to see how it performs, and their argument is that it could lead to cheaper internet access for those who don't do much on their computers and don't use the internet a lot. But that's kind of concerning for the people that actually do use their internet quite often. I mean, I use my internet a lot, and I use a lot of it. And while it's not super expensive, it couldn't get a whole lot more expensive without me having to cut other things out to pay for the internet. That's why I don't use my data package on my phone very much, because it's super low so that I don't have a huge bill. Not to mention, it might cause issues with things like 4K, and as we start streaming more and more and we get higher quality and better, you know, better versions of things, it uses more internet. Broadband internet is the backbone of our connected lives. Sure, you could make the argument that mobile's becoming more prominent, but if you really look at it, broadband or quote-unquote landline internet is still the dominant force. I mean, look at it this way. Like, if you go to a family member or a friend's house or Starbucks, what's one of the first things you do? You get the Wi-Fi password. Why? Because it's fast. Well, at least usually it's faster than your mobile internet. It's relatively cheap in comparison to your mobile internet. And you can use it to your heart's desire without worrying about a impeding cap. Getting ever closer and closer that's going to make you have to spend a ton more money. A cap that's make-believe, a cap that companies invent just to gouge us, the consumers, for more money. A cap that's only a reality because the big internet service providers have been protected by the government from other companies coming in because they argue that the infrastructure is too expensive for a bunch of small companies to be in and it would make the prices go up for everybody. A cap that would never exist if these companies had to face the real free market competition like pretty much every other company in America. In an age where connected home, 4K, Internet of Things, and all of this stuff is becoming everyday reality, the Internet service providers have decided to take a step back in development, and it's a bad business model. What kind of company thinks that they're going to survive and that they're going to make it in the real world when instead of creating new things and innovating and making new products for consumers to buy, they just start charging god-awful amounts for using extra of the product you're already paying to use? Now, I understand the whole you go to the store and you buy a box of cereal. And once that cereal is done, you go buy another box. And that's their argument, that that is how they're just going to start doing the internet like that. 
but they're not going from a, oh, before you could just buy a subscription and have all the cereal that you wanted, but now we're still going to make you that subs- pay that subscription, but if you use over one box worth of cereal in a month, we're going to make you pay extra for your extra boxes. So really, you're paying $60 a month for one box of cereal. I just don't think it's a good idea. And I think it's going to, it's going to get to the point where competition is going to rely on whether or not you charge me for a data cap. I would pay $5 or $10 more a month for a service that didn't have a data cap than I would for a service that was going to charge me for going over a certain amount of data, even if I never go over that data. And the reason why is because I don't want to have to worry about it. I want to know what my bill is going to be every month, and then I want to move on with my life. And I want to use the internet to my heart's desire. These internet service providers just need to find something else to innovate. They need to create a new product or a new concept or something instead of just trying to charge more for the same thing that they've been charging you less for the whole time. Now, I understand inflation, different things like that. Your bill is going to continue to go up. It will never go down unless you get a promotion or something like that. And I understand that and I understand that that's how the economy works. But this whole data cap thing is a big load of horse shit. This is against my civil rights. Pokemon games are coming. A few weeks ago, they ha- Nintendo had an online event and they unveiled the next big Pokemon games. Now, a few episodes back when we were talking about the 20th anniversary, I made a special note to say that they didn't have any games on their actual release lineup when, when they were talking about their Super Bowl commercials and the other things that they were doing this year. And I thought that was kind of weird and out of character. And it turns out that they were just not talking about it then, but they really are coming out with games. Sun and Moon are the two releases that are coming to the 3DS this holiday, and they're the first major entries in the series since Pokemon X and Y back in 2013. It's going to be available at the same time worldwide, and it'll launch in nine different languages, including traditional and simplified Chinese. Nintendo's hope is that players can overcome language barriers and interact with other players around the world. I think that that's really cool. I think it's cool that this company can say, we want people to bridge a barrier that is really difficult with our game. It's just, it's kind of like music. Even though you may not understand what they're saying, if they are saying words, you can still feel the emotion of the music. And that's what they want to create with this video game. And I think that's amazing. A couple of other games. In March, the fighting game Pokin Tournament on the Wii U is coming out, which was created by some of the guys behind Tekken and Soul Calibur. I think that'll be a really, really fun game. And then later this year, Pokemon Go is going to come out on iOS and Android, which I am super, super stoked for. Hello, I'm Bill Nye. You may know me from such things as science. What color is this? Again. Does the jacket match the dress? One year to the day after the dress debacle happened. That was when people were asking if this dress was black and blue or white and gold. Another clothing item has hit the web mysteriously and miraculously. Nina Penzo. I'm horrible with names. We've talked about this before. Nina Penzo, also known on Tumblr as Pop Punk Blogger posted an image of an Adidas jacket and asked what color it appeared to fellow users. Is it black and brown? Is it green and gold? Or what about green and brown? She asked. Since the image was posted on the social media site last Thursday, it has received more than 17,000 reblogs. Penzo also told ABC that the jacket was actually baby blue and white, but she still wanted to go to Tumblr to, en- to enlist the help of social media users. That's just stupid. You already know what the color is. It just looks different to you. She tried to say that she had no intention of blowing up and she didn't think it would get as big as it did. Well, that's a load of horse shit. Your whole goal was to get 
to blow up, to get famous, for everyone to follow your blog. You cannot sit there and tell me that you are going to carbon copy something that literally took the internet by storm a year ago and and not expect or not tr- be trying to get famous. That is what you did. You wanted your 15 minutes of fame and apparently you got it because ABC News is interviewing you and I'm talking about you on my podcast. So I guess I can't really hate on her too much because, I mean, she achieved her goal, I guess. A BuzzFeed poll reported that 72% of the people found the dress to be blue and white, 10% believed it was black and brown, and the other percentages were broken up between green and gold or green and brown. If you do something like this the first time, so the people that originally did it, sure, they they probably didn't think it was going to blow up and turn into a worldwide ordeal and gain a bunch of fame from it. They didn't expect it because no one had ever done it in that specific style before. This person literally just copied them and then tried to say they weren't trying to make a buzz. You know they were, they know they were. Stop being a liar. That's the problem I have. I don't care that they did something stupid to try to get famous on the internet because that's pretty much what the internet's about. I care that they lied about it, really. I think that's my main problem. I fart in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Good guy, Google. Google and phone carriers are teaming up to try to give text messaging an overhaul. Google's partnering with major phone carriers, including Sprint, the owning company of T-Mobile, Dutch Telecom, Orange, and Vodafone to succeed SMS and MMS, which are the standards that they use right now. The newer communications standard would be called Rich Communication Services, or RCS. This RCS would let you send higher quality photos, start group chats, and potentially do a lot more in the future. Basically, it's iMessage for Android, which would be nice because if any of you have an Android phone, then you know the pain of trying to have a group chat on an Android phone. It is absolutely god-awful and miserable, and it makes it just super inconvenient. So inconvenient that I refuse to do it. I'd rather just text everybody separately. None of the features are really exciting, though, to be completely honest. I mean, you have Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. Snapchat, uh, Slack's getting something that's going to be kind of similar, Google Hangouts, and everything else. I mean, pretty much any social app has most of these features built into them already. But the nice thing about this is it would be built into the phones. It wouldn't have to be something that you're going to download, which would be nice because, to be honest, most of the time I don't download extra apps to do things that my phone already does. Like, I don't download WhatsApp for my text messaging and all that because my phone already has a text message app and it's just easier to use that one. But it would be nice to have the group chat feature on my Android phone. That would be the one thing that I would really enjoy about it. The peculiar thing, though, is that AT&T, Verizon, and technically T-Mobile, in the United States at least, their U.S. division, are not involved with this service. And that makes me wonder... It could just be that they haven't gotten around to it or their lawyers are still looking at the agreements or whatever. But it could also mean that these companies are going to start coming out with their own stuff that is either going to cost more money or that won't work cross device. And then you're going to have another issue. So like, oh, I have AT&T, but my buddy over there has T-Mobile and we both have these services. They won't freaking work together. So we can't even use them. And that would just be stupid. It's another, it's kind of like the broadband situation. I mean, you, there are so many things in common between the internet service providers and your mobile carriers that it's just astounding. Like, neither of them want to worry about innovating and research and development and creating new stuff. They would just want to charge you for shit you can already do. <laughs> All right, we're about halfway through the show, and as is tradition, I am going to play a song, and the song I'm playing today is called The Resistance, and it is by the band Rev Nation. We are the product of
Again, that song was called The Resistance, and it was by the band Rev Nation. And if you like them and you want to check them out, I will have links to all of their various sites in the show notes below. The local news of the week. Good Guy Airbus. Now, this is a company that is innovating and creating new things for their business instead of just trying to charge you for old shit. So Airbus is working on new ways to make flying more comfortable for overweight passengers. So right now, basically, you have to try to squeeze into that seat. And on top of that, they make you buy two tickets. They make you buy a ticket for the seat next to you, too. Well, a lot of the airlines do. And they're trying to figure out something better, something that's going to make it a lot easier. So what they've done is they filed a patent for a reconfigurable passenger bench seat. So basically, it's one bench, one long bench. Uh, The armrests, I think, from the picture I saw will come down if you want them to, but you can leave them up if you want. Basically, the seat belts on it can move. So what it would do is it can accommodate two large adults, three less large adults, or two adults and two children. So it just depends. And granted, don't get me wrong, if you are a larger adult and you can only fit two on there, they are going to charge you more. They'll charge you less if you're uh, three adults, and they may even charge you a little less if you have the two adults and two kids. Depends. you know. But that's irrelevant because, yeah, they're still going to charge you, but 
They're making it more comfortable at the same time. You see what they're doing? They're innovating, creating something new, and they're going to charge you for it. But that's how business works. It shouldn't be that they're they're not saying, oh, well, you know, that seat that you already paid $300 for, yeah, we're going to make you pay an extra $75 because you're going to have to put the armrest up. It's just ridiculous. And I know that I'm just ranting and complaining at this point, but it just really, really grinds my gears. The Oscars happened. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that you have heard podcast and podcast and podcast that's talked about who won, why they thought they should have won, why they didn't think they should have won, who they thought should have won, and a million other things. So I am not going to talk about the winners. I'm not going to talk about who I thought should have won. And I'm not going to talk about who wasn't nominated, and how I think that that was a snub either. We've heard countless people, and there's countless shows and articles that talk about it. But what I do want to talk about is Leonardo DiCaprio, Sylvester Stallone, and Chris Rock. These were all things, of course, that did happen at the Oscars. So Leonardo DiCaprio won. Cool. I'm not going to talk about the fact that he won. I'm not going to talk about the fact that I wanted him to win. Uh, (laughs) But... After he won, it became a catalyst for more than 440,000 tweets per minute. It made Leo's win the most tweeted minute of an Oscars telecast ever. The one that was before was Ellen DeGeneres' selfie back in 2014, which spawned 255,000 tweets per minute. 440,000 tweets per minute. Sounds like everybody wanted Leo to win. Talking about Sylvester Stallone, he did not win. Once again, I'm not going to talk about who won and who didn't win, but he didn't win. And the thing that was amazing about what happened is that when he didn't win, he came out with a statement that said, To all the real Rockies of the world, please hang on to your dreams. Never give in, never get out, never give up. Thanks for the support. And I think that is amazing. It shows how much character Sylvester Stallone has and how he's just how much of an all around good guy he is. He's saying to all the young kids or the teens or young adults out there that know how he feels that, oh, you know, this was a big opportunity and he could have won an award and he didn't, but he's not going to complain about it. He's not going to yell about it. He's not going to shout about it. He wants to keep keep trying. He's not going to give up. He's not going to give in and he's not going to give out. And I think that is great. Now, Frank Stallone, his brother, on the other hand, he wrote, it's as clear as the nose on your face that Sly won. Mark who? It's total Hollywood bullshit. And later he apologized and Sylvester said, you know, my brother was just, he's supporting me. He was real upset, blah, blah, blah. And you know, you can't expect any different from a brother. And I understand. And there's a, you know, that bond and everything. So I'm not really too mad at him, but he probably shouldn't have tweeted it or anything. You know, he probably should have just like kept it to himself or, you know, like wrote it down in a journal or something. But either way. And Chris Rock's monologue. I think that he approached a sensitive situation in a good way with the humor. It was nice to be able to joke about it a little bit. And and while the underlying you know the underlying point of his jokes were to make a statement i think that he made a good statement he made the statement that times are changing things are changing they may not be good yet but they are moving into the realm of it can start getting good He also made the point to say that everything's not always about racism or sexism, which I think is another important thing. We focus so much on racism and sexism that sometimes we it gets out of control and things that shouldn't be about racism or sexism become about it because we're so used to hearing it. But the most important thing that he said was we want opportunity. 
And I think that's the key. That is the biggest thing from his speech. It's not that he was upset that black actors didn't get nominated or minorities didn't get nominated. He's trying to make the point that more would be nominated if they had more opportunities to be in films that were Oscar worthy. Because most of the movies that are made every year aren't Oscar worthy and they're not written to be, they're not produced to be, they're not directed to be, they're just out there to be funny movies or good movies or whatever they want them to be. But there are the ones that are meant to be Oscar contenders. And he's saying that as a community, minorities want an opportunity to be in those movies because there is still racism in Hollywood. And he would know. He would know better than most of us out here. And I think he made a lot. All I'm trying to say is that he made a lot of good points and he did it in a nice, funny way so that you would it basically what the comedy did was it reduced the backlash you know people didn't get up in arms as much about it because he made it funny and so i really liked what he said and i think he did a good job hey um can i have a mcrib meal large size with the dr pepper mcdonald's is joining the virtual reality party ladies and gentlemen This month, it's going to have a limited run of Happy Goggles. It's a VR that basically looks like Google Cardboard, and it's created by deconstructing the Happy Meal box. McDonald's is going to launch the promotion in 14 restaurants in Sweden over the first two weekends in March. So this weekend and next weekend. So if you're in Sweden and you're listening to this right now, keep listening, jump in your car, go drive over to the McDonald's, get you a Happy Meal, and get you a little uh, Google Happy Goggles. Only 3,500 headsets are going to be made available, so I guarantee we're going to see some that are pretty expensive on eBay and, you know, Amazon Marketplace or something like that because there's definitely going to be people here in the States and in other countries that are going to want some. It hasn't been announced on whether they're going to try it in other countries, but I guarantee that if it's a big hit in Sweden, they're going to make something happen in some other countries, especially with how fast VR is becoming a reality. And this is a way to get kids interested in things like virtual reality and, you know, augmentation and different stuff like that. So I think it's cool. Uh, It'll probably make your face smell like oily garbage, but, um, eh, you know. Small price to pay for a free VR box, right? Excuse me, bitch! All right, and before we wrap the show up, I do want to do an app review. This week, I'm reviewing the app called Stack, and it's available on iPhone and Android. This app is, I mean, it's super basic. You start out, you have this one little brick, and there's a brick going back and forth over it. And when you touch the screen, the brick that's moving back and forth stops. And your goal is to get it to stop when it's exactly lined up with the brick under it. And as you do that, they stack higher and higher and higher. Your goal is to see how high you can get this stack to be. Now, if you stop the brick and it's not quite all the way over the brick that you're trying to stop it on, part of the one that you stopped will fall off and it will become smaller. And then the brick that you try to stop on top of it will be smaller too. And that's how you lose. Eventually, it gets so small that you just can't stop it on top of the one that's under it. Now, once you've messed up and your brick has been cut down in size a little bit, you can, if you go, I think it's 10 times of stacking one on top of the other and not cutting any of it off, not messing up at all, it will start to get bigger. And then every sequential time, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's really a mind numbing game. I mean, it takes a little bit of concentration, but overall, it's just one of those like whip it out and play with it for five minutes or something like that when you're, you know, waiting at whatever the doctor's office or waiting for your McDonald's VR headset or whatever you're doing. I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I'm not very good at it, but that's neither here nor there. It's still a lot of fun. So definitely go check it out and let me know what you think about it. Hey for iPad search, hey for iPod search, hey for cell phone search, hey for laptop search, hey for tablet search, hey for 3 g 4 g ready. If you find value in the show and you want to show your support by becoming a producer of the Just John podcast, you now can. Find out how at patreon.com slash jfmedina2010. If you enjoyed the show, please show me some love by liking, thumbs up, subscribing, sharing, rating, reviewing, retweeting, or whatever it is that's used to symbolize the love of the show on the platform you're using to view it. 
You can follow me on Twitter at Johnny M underscore Revo and at Facebook.com slash Just John Podcast. You can find the show at JustJohnPodcast.com or on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, Spreaker, or some other shit. You can email me at JustJohnPodcast at gmail.com. And remember, without you, I'm just some dude talking to himself on the internet. Until next time, peace out, fam.